There's a lot of talk about prostate. Most of it's prostate cancer. Well, prostate cancer is a frequent problem for men. There's no question about that. But benign prostatic hypertrophy outnumbers it many, many fold. Why? Well, we'll get into that. Benign prostatic hypertrophy is part of the endowment of living for us guys. Now women have their, have their complementary issues, but for us, benign prostatic hypertrophy is almost a sure thing. Now when I say a sure thing, what I mean by that is if I or another urologist examines you at a certain point in life, which we'll talk about, your prostate will be enlarged. That doesn't mean you necessarily have symptoms. I've seen patients who've had prostates at least five or six times the size of I, what I would consider a normal prostate and avoiding symptoms at all. But usually that's not the case. Usually if the prostate's enlarged, people do have symptoms, and we'll talk about those symptoms. The thing that you hear most about when you hear about the word surgery these days is, quote, minimally invasive. Now, minimally invasive is a word that I'll show you has historical significance, and not only that, I'll show you that urology was first. But minimally invasive basically means you can have your problem, whatever it is, treated, hopefully solved, and get back to what you were doing very quickly. In other words, the big incisions <coughs> that are associated with the idea of having a bladder problem, maybe a prostate problem, maybe a gallbladder problem, don't need to be in most, but not all, cases. Now the prostate encompasses the urethra. And if we look at the prostate as this organ here, and we turn it up like this, what we're really looking at is something that looks like a donut. And that's where the urethra passes through the prostate, or it's called the prostatic urethra. Now, as the prostate changes in size, some interesting things happen. Well, first, let's define prostatic enlargement in the context that we want to talk about it tonight. This is not cancer. It's benign. And it's enlargement of the gland. <coughs> that is part of a natural aging process. There's no disease involved here, guys. This is part of the territory. Hair changes, wearing glasses. It's all part of the same thing. I'll take my glasses off, but I can't read it. It cannot be prevented, but it can be treated. This is a drawing. This is illustrative of a normal bladder and prostate. And notice that you have a nice channel here for the urine to flow through. Now, I'm sure many of you have washed your car and you've gotten a hose hooked around the wheel and all of a sudden the stream drops off and the hose behind the king gets fat. It's exactly what happens here. The prostate enlarges, the stream is, the uh, urethra is compressed, and you don't necessarily stop urinating. Maybe this poor soul did because that's fairly advanced. But what happens is the bladder hypertrophies, the bladder walls get thick. It's just like, uh, you know, the weightlifter's arm it gets big. The problem is that it happens so subtly that you really have to think about it to know what's going on. And what we want to do tonight is talk about how we can influence this prostate beneficially. Now we're not talking about prostate cancer, but you can bet your bottom dollar we check and make sure it's not there before we go plowing ahead. So what are the symptoms? Well, you can read that. Frequency, urgency, stream, slow, uh, getting up at night, feeling like maybe I didn't really empty it, 
I've got to go back. Familiar symptom. The bladder has a very unique characteristic. It's called compliance. The muscles of the bladder slide one over the other, unlike a balloon. And as the bladder gets bigger in health, normally, you can go from this size to this size, and there's no difference in pressure on the inside of the bladder because of compliance. But when the bladder wall gets thick, these things don't work so well. And therefore, this creates pressure in the bladder. Minimally invasive prostate surgery. First, I want to clear up a lot of misunderstanding. Minimally invasive prostate surgery means that we can take care of your prostate problem and not disturb things very much. It means no incision. It means that the prostate, the donut, is changed so that the channel through which you avoid is bigger. Let me show you the first minimally invasive. This is transurethral resection. This is a resectoscope. This is the first minimally invasive instrument in the armamentarium of medicine. This was actually done in the 1800s with candles and mirrors to transmit light. At one point there was an incandescent bulb at the end of the scope so you could illuminate and see. Now it's fiber optic, same thing that's in the flexible instruments and there's a very bright light source off the side. The tuna prostiva system, they're part of the same chain of evolution, uses radio frequency and in the words of uh, George Bush Sr., maybe kinder and gentler. The procedure now using radio frequency can be done with local anesthesia and a little sedation. Many of the patients that we treat, we treat in an office environment. We can deliver that treatment in less than an hour in most circumstances. And the patients can be on their way home with a driver uh, shortly thereafter. Low level radio frequency energy is transmitted in the prostate through this type of a system. This is an antenna and then an antenna generates a radio frequency which then generates heat. And as we heat these structures, go ahead. we essentially alter this tissue. And we don't have to heat it to boil it. We heat it to an area that's well above normal temperature. And then we have a whole vocabulary of our own, and we say that tissue atrophies we can say it shrinks. So what happens if the wall of the donut shrinks? The donut hole gets bigger, the resistance to passage of urine goes down. So, most patients can get back to what they were doing in a short period of time. Most of the time we'll put a catheter in and it comes out the next morning. And we'll show the patient how to take the catheter out. We'll see him in the afternoon. And we do a bladder scan to make sure that's correct. A few side effects and studies show long-term durability. Now, I grasped this study uh, a few years back and clung to it. But I can tell you that I have well over 150 patients that I've treated over the years and some of them are eight years, some are 10 years, and they're doing just fine. Now, have I ever had to retreat a patient I've treated like this? You bet. And I'll tell you why. Because people hear that it's kinder and gentler, and that's what people want, right? Well, as you creep up on the size of the prostate, bending the rules a little bit because we're going to be kinder and gentler, you fail sometimes. But not all the time. Some of those folks do just fine. 
But we go into that open-minded and say, look, if you have a problem and you're in that category, we may have to come back and use one of the other treatments. But they choose this. So it's a popular treatment. It's uh, one that patients really like. And generally speaking, it's well covered by insurance programs. It's one-stop shopping. And